Welcome to a special liberal conversation series of the Dissidents podcast. In this series, we invite guests who have resources, ideas, and viewpoints that will challenge us to reflect on liberal values, what they are, how they are applied, their impact on us as individuals, and why they matter for the larger communities in which we live. The Dissidents Podcast is brought to you by the Institute for Liberal Values, a nonpartisan and non sectarian consortium focused on the promotion of individual freedom, rights, and liberty in everyday life. Hi. Today on the Dissidents Podcast, we have Sharice Trump. She, no relation, she <laughs> is the executive director of Speech First. She was formerly with the Heritage Foundation, where she served as the associate director of coalition relations and spent some time as program manager of the Anders Alexander Hamilton Society. Her essays and articles have appeared in the Wall Street Journal and Newsweek, among many other outlets. And Sharice is the host of her own podcast called Well Said, where she interviews people about free speech and American culture. So welcome, Sharice. I want to give you a few minutes first to talk about yeah. speech first. Tell us what that is and how you uh, got started. Yeah, so we're a pretty young organization. We are founded in 2018. And the, our, what our mission is, is to essentially protect students' free speech rights in, on college campuses. And in order to defend them properly, we found that uh, the legal strategy and litigation is probably one of the most effective ways to protect those rights uh, and, and to make sure we hold bad actors at universities accountable. Uh, so we actually are a membership organization, still a nonprofit, 501c3, uh, but a membership organization, and we defend our student members' rights on campuses. And so when we represent them, it'll be speech first versus the school. And that way, students don't have to worry so much about the university retaliating against them, because obviously, at the end of the day, they still want to go to school, get good grades, and get their diplomas, um, but they also want to stand up for their rights. So that's some, that we kind of give them that avenue to do so. And, you know, we educate students on their legal rights. I visit campuses often to discuss, uh, you know, what's going on in American culture with students, but also American history and culture with free speech and why it's so unique and special here in the United States. And then I also tell them what their legal rights are in various scenarios, you know, talking through, you know, if your club can't get recognized because of viewpoint discrimination or if if you feel like your administrators are specifically investigating you for your constitutionally protected speech, these are the steps that you can take. Uh, so in addition to educating students, we also advocate on their behalf. In, you know, we, we sue schools, but then we're also going out there and telling lawmakers what the next steps are, what they need to be doing to protect their students' rights. Because, you know, students at the end of the day are not the exception when it comes to whose rights lawmakers should be standing up for and protecting. Uh, they, they are also citizens and residents of their states, so they should also be protecting their rights as much as anyone else's. So I was looking at the website. It looks to me like students can join, maybe um, uh, get started engaging on campus sort of with the assistance of your of your organization. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty, yeah, pretty straightforward to become a member at Speech First. It's a $5 lifetime fee. You just sign up, you'll get emails, updates, newsletters. Uh, but that being a member, so anyone can be a member, it doesn't have to just be students. But for students specifically, once you're a member, uh, you know, coming to us and telling us what's going on on your campus is key to us understanding, you know, the bigger picture, what's happening on the ground. But also when we're thinking through our litigation strategy, uh, you know, telling us if there's any policies on your campus that are specifically targeting your constitutionally protected speech, then that's something that we can have a conversation about. So once you're a member, yes, Speech First can uh, defend you and represent you in the court of law. But there's also lots of good information there too. Yes, exactly. Uh, not just for not not just to get involved legally, but just just to look and see what's there. Um, I watched some of your your recent testimony, um, and you know looked at some of the uh, your filings, and and uh, so there's a lot there for people to look yeah. at, and I encourage them to look whether they join or not. Obviously, you encourage them to join, but uh, yeah. regardless, there's there's a lot of material there, and one of the things that really caught my eye that you had recently uh, been focusing on was bias reporting systems. And so yeah. this is, again, I'm, I'm a college professor, so this is, um, you know, it's very relevant in all mm -hmm. of this is very relevant in my, in my daily life. Um, but I, I'm interested to, if, if you are willing to talk a little bit about, uh, I know what one is, but you know, not all of our listeners <laughs> will know and oh, how absolutely. important yeah. this is in, in terms of, of free speech and, and just culture right now. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Bias response teams and bias reporting systems are kind of our bread and butter at Speech First. We're specifically uh, looking at these policies as they apply, as they are applied against students, but even faculty are at risk of being reported through these bias reporting systems. And now to just kind of do a quick definition of what they are. There are anonymous reporting systems where students uh, and oftentimes even faculty are encouraged to report on one another for incidents of bias. And this is something that we've seen. I mean, this is like straight out of an Orwellian book. You know, it's like something you'd see under the Stasi in, in East Germany when you're thinking about you know, informing on, secretly informing on your peers. Um, and when you look at what, how the university actually defines bias, they'll say a bias incident is really kind of anything that they think is offensive or you think is offensive or unwanted. Universities will list examples as microaggressions, joking, stereotyping, uh, anything that you feel like is un unwanted speech or could cause mental harm. By the way, all of these forms of speech are constitutionally protected forms of speech. So that's a really important factor right there to just say in the beginning, because you're having a university ask students to inform on each other for what's supposed to be your protected right to speak on these issues. So when students know they can be reported anonymously at any time, they don't get to face their accuser, uh, then they are going to stop talking. They're going to stop engaging. They're likely to censor themselves, especially if they know that their views and their ideas that they want to discuss are unpopular and more, more than likely able to get reported. Uh, and so what happens when you are reported is oftentimes you'll get an email um, for from either the dean of students or someone from the DEI department, whoever is housing this uh, this bias response team. Oftentimes when we call it a team, we're referring to the fact that it has multiple administrators as like kind of a body that manages the system. And you'll see DEI department um, administrators on that team. You'll see usually the Dean of Students. In some of the most egregious cases, we've seen uh, campus police officers listed on wow. these teams. Yeah. And so when the university tries to defend its policy and say, oh, this isn't a disciplinary arm or a disciplinary mechanism, I'm like, then why do you have a campus police officer? Right. You know, if it's a, not a disciplinary uh, mechanism on campus, then what is it? What exactly are you trying to do here uh, other than censor and coerce students? So when you are reported, sometimes you'll get an email that will say, hey, you've been reported to this you know, bias reporting system and whatever the university wants to call it. Sometimes they use euphemistic names and the student is asked to come in and essentially explain themselves and explain mm -hmm. the situation. And now if it's an anonymous report, again, like I said, you don't get to face their, your accuser and you're asked to go in. And in, in any public school system case, this has to be an optional meeting because again, you cannot discipline students or investigate them for their constitutionally protected speech. But oftentimes students will either not ask the question of whether or not it's optional or it won't be mentioned up front unless they ask. We've had students ask, uh, have told us they ask if a meeting is optional and the university administrator will say yes, but if you don't come in, you'll be presumed guilty right. of what you're accused of, which is, again, very threatening. Think of yourself as like an 18 or 19 year old. This is your first time out of home, your hometown. Uh, and you're going to you're going to respond to administrators as if they're your boss. I mean, this is a you know, this is an intimidating situation to be in for any student. Uh, so when you go in, what we've seen uh, is, is that not only is the situation investigated by administrators and sometimes campus police officers, but you'll even be asked to sometimes take sensitivity training. And this is full on disciplinary action, uh, sensitivity training or diversity training uh, in response. Again, it might not even be, it could be something as simple as laughing at a joke that someone found offensive or asking where someone is from, which is considered a microaggression on many campuses. So these are not, this is, these are extreme measures in order to intimidate and censor students um, from expressing their oftentimes political views, uh, but even just, you know, basic concepts, like, again, trying to have a regular conversation. And the only thing you can ask yourself is, why do these systems exist? Why is the university trying so hard to crack down on this type of speech? And there are two sides of that coin. One is that administrators are definitely afraid of controversy. They, they do fear what we call the woke mob on campus that's going to freak out if there's ever any incident. Uh, and, and, you know, the, again, like the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So, you know, that's who they're trying to appease in that situation. But that's, that's giving them quite the benefit of the doubt because in a lot of cases, and in most cases we've seen these administrators have political goals. 
They do have political agendas. They are trying to target a specific type of speech. When you see these really broad and subjective definitions of phrasing like offensive speech or unwanted, really what they mean is they want to have the door wide open to selectively enforce that policy against people they disagree with. And that's really what we're looking at here. Yeah. And I, you know, you and you and I emailed a little bit about about sort of just that, you know, mm-hmm. where it seems like, you know, I, I was reading, for example, about the new Princeton principles and, you know, somebody was interviewed and they said, well, you know, there's there's essentially nothing here that that most people wouldn't agree with. Well, that's true, right. but only narrowly applied. So, yes, I agree yeah. with these things so long as it's applied to ideas or people or thoughts or courses or whatever that I also agree with. And it's so, uh, it's just amazing to me how quickly and easily um, people shift or maybe, maybe it's actually the opposite. Maybe it's a lack of maybe not a willingness to do the hard thinking that would be required to take a different perspective. And it's not a you know, Mm -hmm. an opposing perspective, just think about maybe yourself in five years, you know, maybe, um, you know, I think college students and, and especially maybe think of themselves as fully baked, right? They think this is how I'm (laughs) going to believe forever. I've got it now. I've thought of things that nobody else has ever thought of. And I think that's very, uh, you know, I plot, that's very typical. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I felt that way too. Um, but you might actually have a different opinion in a few years. You might be yeah. in a different position in your life or whatever. And the same thing that you think is offensive uh, or harmful or whatever now, you might not think then. Right. Um, and, and you need to, we need, uh, we can't depend on sort of our, our moral compass in the moment um, to guide us through these, uh, you know, nuanced kinds right. of, of decisions because j- just because we don't like it doesn't mean that it's not, you know, again, still protected, hopefully still protected mm-hmm. speech. Um, and that we shouldn't honestly, maybe that we shouldn't hear it, that, you know, truth be told. Um, and so, and I also, you know, you mentioned like just students afraid to engage faculty afraid to engage. Yeah. I mean, I mean, nobody speaks in class anymore. And I'm not saying it's because of this specifically, but this is just one more thing, right? Right. It's one more thing that's keeping them. They come in, I come into the classroom now. Mm -hmm. They don't even turn on the lights. The lights are out when I get there. They're just sitting there in the dark, looking at their phones. They used to be talking to each other and stuff, you know, even if it was just to complain about me before I got there. So we already have people Mm. who are extremely isolated and who've yeah. gotten in the habit of that and gotten in the habit of monitoring each other via social media. And yeah. now you mm-hmm. add this, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, um, it, it's, I mean, I'm using old language now, but it's chilling, right? It's right. just, it's just, yeah. And chilling get... is the, the legal term that we typically use in our, in our litigation. You, you said so many things just now that I really am excited to unpack because there are, there really are just, First off, you know, when we're talking about being unplugged from reality and being just stuck on your screens and stuck in your phones, I mean, one thing students probably don't realize, but they definitely sense is that we live essentially in a surveillance state right now Mm -hmm. in that we are constantly watching each other um, or watch. We're always taking videos of each other. We're taking pictures of each other. Um, You see scenarios where there's something happening and everyone, instead of helping, stops to record it. Uh, And that is something that is really dividing the nation, in my opinion, but even especially the younger folks who are supposed to be engaging, because the way you give each other the benefit of the doubt, especially in debate and political discourse, is to understand one another as humans, that you have that thing in common, that you that there's something that you can come together around, that you are both human beings with preferences and ideas, and you respect one another. You can't have that sense of humanity if you are not even engaging with humans, if you are constantly on technology. And we have fooled ourselves, uh, especially my generation, the millennial generation, and the Zoomer generation have fooled ourselves into thinking that community and human engagement is supplemented through these social media apps, because that's really what people are thinking. Oh, there, we have such a strong sense of community. We're always talking to each other. We're always engaging. 
very, very different level of engagement online than in reality and in person. A lot of, in fact, most of the things people say online, they would never say to someone's face. So I think this is, you know, we are completely lost when it comes to coming together and engaging with one another. And when we're talking about the college environment where you're supposed to, like you said, students like to think that they're fully baked by the time they like everything is, you know, they have their convictions and they're ready to go. But you really don't get that confirmation until someone challenges you on your ideas. And you need to figure out at that time in your life, and you have, the great thing about four years in college is that you have that time, right? A lot of students don't work. There are some that do. I worked in college, so I didn't get as much social engagement as I would have liked to out of college. But most students do get to live together and engage with one another um, and be present around each other. And you have that time when you don't, you're not raising a family and you don't have this like big career that you're working on to fully figure out if your convictions are still going to be your convictions in four to six years or so. And you can't really do that unless people challenge you, push back on you, um, and you get to kind of experience that intellectual growth because that's ultimately what college is for. I go to these campuses a lot and I ask students, one of the first questions I ask is, what is college for? Like, what is the university for? And they're like, oh, to get a job, to get a degree. And I'm like, but these are very superficial things. Really, you're here to seek truth. You're here to develop yourselves intellectually and to figure out, to get to the bottom of all of your ideas and all of your thoughts. And you can't do that if you're not asking the right questions, if you're not allowing people to challenge you. Another thing I mention to students all the time, which they are, it's a very toxic idea to them, which is this idea of trying to, uh, try, uh, the idea of being wrong, the idea of being wrong in public and out loud I was like, no, you have to, you have to experience those moments of questioning, of skepticism with other people's ideas, but even with your own, uh, because that's not what's going, that's going to be what pushes you to do more research, to learn more about the issues that you care about. I, I spoke up so much in college. I was always speaking up. If you can't tell, I like to talk. I mean, I was, I always debated with my students and my professors, um, that environment is pretty much gone in the classroom today. Yep. Uh, yep. But it used to be pretty common to get those like at least last 20 minutes of the class where you're just open discussion, everyone's throwing out ideas. And there were definitely times where I threw out an idea that was half-baked. And I was just like, this is kind of what I think. And people really just would aggress. Ask a question, like what right. if? Right? Ask a and question, they, push they back on something. They don't, and people well, they don't even, well, what I teach a lot of upper level courses where I sign primary sources. So there's mm -hmm. not a textbook. Yeah. It's read a research article. And, you know, you used to get the whole like, oh, you know, N of one thing where they would say, well, you know, my grandmother smoked, you know, two packs of cigarettes a day and, and lived to 104 or whatever. You would mm -hmm. get that. You, and, and you still get that lived experience kind of response where it's like, well, yeah. that's not the story that I know kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we still get that. But now we also get um, just a total dismissal of a research, uh, you know, a, a, a published paper. Um, it's because it doesn't have the right uh, participants in it. They right. think it's not the right yeah. participants, and um, or you know, it's it you know the 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 bias answer, and it just shuts down all discussion because it's like, oh, here's I found something wrong with the study, right. and it's something wrong that nobody wants to talk about, and they get to they just get to be done. It's like, oh well, you know, it's gosh, it looks like there's you know almost all women in this study. Well, that's because <laughs> it's almost all women in a in a um, in psychology programs, and so mm -hmm. you get your subject pools from psychology. That's more women than men. That's not a flaw in the, you know, that's something we can certainly talk about. What would that mean? Again, ask a question. What would this, what would it mean? What do you, do you think it would have changed the results if it was a majority men versus women in the study? That's a totally useful, productive kind of discussion topic. Right. But what we get is more of the, the shut down, just like find a way to shut down the discussion as opposed to what you're talking about, where it's like, well, let me just throw something out there and see what, you know, I'm trying to figure this out. Can we talk about it? And, and that right. almost never happens. I think they're afraid. And once somebody brings up something, anything that's remotely bias related, even if it's something as simple as the subjects, as they were described in the study, we're done. It's over. Yeah. And that's yeah. all they're going to write about in their, in their essays. I give them a little essay question. They just write about, you know, they just criticize like the participants section of the study. 
The and unfortunate thing, so that is actually a habit that is reaching across not just papers and reading how, how students read and interpret information, but it's how they debate issues yes. too. Yes. And it's becoming, we are now in a place where I know very few young people who actually understand how to have an actual debate, especially on political issues. Um, and it's because of this, this value, this, what, what's, what's happening is they're equating objective arguments abstract arguments to personal lived experiences mm -hmm. and they believe that those hold just that those lived experience hold just as much weight in an argument um, as as do objective facts and unfortunately that is absolutely not true but what happens when students continue to say like say say you have two students arguing like in a debate and they're talking about a, an aggressive you know a big political issue when a student stops the debate and says actually, I do know this is true because this happened to me or right. this happened to my mother. And I know that it's true because of that. All of a sudden, two things are happening there. Yeah. Now you can no longer talk about the issue objectively because it's now become a personal issue. Therefore, everything you push back on that argument is now a personal attack on the person who's arguing with you. So all of a sudden, it's now become a personal attack if you push back, if you try to argue your point, even if it's factually based, because they brought it to that personal level. Right. Uh, but the second thing that's happening is that, again, you're taking personal experiences on a very, very narrow uh, subset of experiences and applying it to, the, to all of society and uh, these very ob objective ideas and facts. And so... You're not have you don't feel obligated as long as you have a personal experience. You don't feel obligated to actually research any of the facts or actually learn about the issues because you have a personal experience that you believe is equal in in strength of argument as as those objective facts. And that's why we have seen this extreme deterioration of debate and open discourse on campuses. Uh, and you know you. It, you mentioned earlier that this discussion is not really happening in the classroom anymore. I've talked to a number of faculty members. Part of it's because of the bias response teams. Part of it's mm -hmm. because they're afraid of being accused of harassment, which we can talk about how universities abuse harassment policies left and right. But professors are no longer even allowing students to have open discussion anymore. They'll usually, a lot of them tell me they just lecture and leave mm -hmm. because they are afraid of what's going to happen whether students are going to upset one another, they're going to get upset at the faculty member if they play devil's advocate on something or if they ask an offensive question. You know, there's there's all sorts of things that are unknowns that can happen. So better to just keep it known and just go in there, make your lecture and don't stick around to see what happens afterwards. That is so detrimental to intellectual growth uh, for yeah. students. And if students feel like the only that they don't need that discussion in order to be educated, then it's just over, game over now. Like it's not, <laughs> I don't know how we can recover from right. that. Right. Uh, but it is, yeah. And most of them haven't seen formal debates. I often ask them when I speak on campuses, how many of you have seen an actual debate? And most of them have not even experienced one or seen one. And the ones that do raise their hands to say they have seen one, I ask them to outline the characteristics of what that debate and what makes it a debate. And we talk about the importance of a timely argument, you know, that p those, those arguers are actually limited to a certain amount of time, the importance of objective facts that they have to present, the importance of having like kind of a, a mentality of a moderator, like someone who can keep everyone on track so you don't go off into these other paths, like to actually get to, again, you're trying to seek truth, you're trying to get to a real solution. You can't just go on and make, like, lodge these personal attacks on things if you're actually attempting to solve the problem through discussion. Um, so that's something that I think is very, the art of debate is very much lost and we really need to find ways to reclaim it on campuses. Yeah. When, when I asked them, I said, well, you know, let's just suspend that for a minute, <laughs> right? And talk about, you know, the meat of the study. What if this were true? They can't right. do that. They can't do it. And that's, I think, why they, they, they sort of, uh, it's like, well, there's no point because the study's biased or, you know, there's no point because it's not my lived experience. So the right. research is all bad. Any, I mean, there, you know, we have this general like problem with science, right? The research yeah. is all bad. It's all biased. It's all no, whatever. And so my lived experience or what I see on TikTok or whatever that's the truth. And so there's no point in suspending for a few minutes, my, mm -hmm. my truth, whatever that is to sort yeah. of let in some new information, consider it. And, you know, and like you said, really build, like, what are my values? I need to yeah. figure that out. And I need to figure out because 
it could there you could very well hopefully in your life you will be lucky enough to be in situations where your values will be challenged right. you know i mean and really that is that is i mean i say lucky enough because that means you are out in the world doing things and interacting with people and everything and and those people are not all going to ag agree with you. It's not going to be situations that are all comfortable. Right. And, you know, it's just, and, you know, I was thinking about your, um, you know, we were talking about the, the, the whole online thing. And I think to a large extent, they think that tweeting about it is doing something about it. And yeah. so, I, I mean, you're really challenging people. Look, don't just say that you're, you know, you believe in free speech or don't just say some, you know, actually do something, talk to other people about it, engage, some, right. you know, with the, with these ideas, because it's not the same thing to just like a video uh, <laughs> or, or whatever it's um, you know, it's, it, it is talking about it and not, you know, they'll say, you know, Oh, we talk to each other all the time. They're not talking at all. They're no, they, they're, they they're often, the, yeah. Exactly. They think that ta making comments online is the same as talking, talking. to someone to their yes. face, but there is something very, very unique and special about being face to face with someone and actually keeping your emotions in check and having to react to something, respond to something in the moment without Googling it first. And right. so saying something is biased is such a cop out, you know, to shut something down because it removes all requirements for critical thought. And like you were saying, you know, challenging yourself to ask real questions um, when you're engaging with someone one on one, you when you can't come up with an answer immediately because you didn't take the time to go Google it and like then post it online and retweet it and all these things, you actually have to ask questions to progress through the discussion. You have to stop the person, ask them questions, force them to explain themselves more. Then you can wrap your head around it, come up with a valid response. Um, but those that exercise doesn't really occur. That critical thinking between two people engaging with one another does not occur if you're online. It does not occur if you're just staying silent in the classroom, for sure. Um, but the reason students really are afraid to engage, again, comes down to the fact that they're afraid to be embarrassed or mm -hmm. um, fail, fail publicly because they're so out of practice with it. I mean, I tell, I tell parents all the time, like, you have to have these discussions at the dinner table. I know a lot of folks really just want to be like, no politics at the dinner table or, you know, no politics during the holidays. And I'm like, it doesn't have to turn into an argument of, you know, with, a, with heightened emotions. Having these regular discussions around your kids as they grow up, having those discussions in the classroom help us get better. No one's perfect when they start to articulate their ideas, but they're not going to learn how to articulate them if they're literally never asked to. And one thing that well, I go back to like the whole shame of being wrong in public, because once you're wrong, like that really does motivate you to do more digging, you know, and that really does make you be like, oh my gosh, I don't ever want to feel that way again. You know, I don't ever want to not know the answer to something out loud again. Yeah, so you I'm might not have been wrong, but you couldn't defend your, regardless. Right? You, or yeah, or you couldn't defend your argument properly. So you're right. going to go dig and you're going to go look into it. And when we're talking about convictions that students are so supposedly either have coming into college or develop while they're in school, Really, when we say convictions, it's not just how developing your ideas, but when people challenge you, that's when you realize what you're not going to bend on. That's when you start to like really dig your heels in and say, actually, a lot of people have challenged me on this and I am going to dig my heels in and I'm going to do more research because this is something I firmly believe. And coming to that conclusion uh, at a young age is important. And so, you know, because that's going to basically determine your moral compass for the rest of your career and, you know, your development of your family. And so having the, being, having that time in college or your early 20s to debate things out, hash things out, figure out what you're not willing to bend on, what your convictions are, and what are the arguments that you care about the most, that is like the prime time to do it. And that's when your mm -hmm. brain is the most elastic for it too, really. Yes. And it also gives you, because you know the, you you have that that knowledge, that core knowledge, you also know when it's time to make a change. Exactly. Right. right. When mm -hmm. it's like, oh, that is how I felt. And I did feel strongly about it. And it was right for me at the time. 
but maybe yeah. it's not right for me now because I know why I felt that way. I also see now that there's an aspect of that that doesn't fit right now. It doesn't fit for whatever reason um, right. because my, my life has changed. I'm a different person, whatever. Um, and I think that when you don't do that deep thinking, then it's just, well, this is, this is it, this is it, you know, and it's, it's like, there's just, there's a barrier there. There's no, there's right. nothing coming in. There's nothing going out. And, um, and yeah, people, people don't, I don't, I, I don't know if they know who they are. I really, I really well, don't. I think it's pretty clear that they don't. I mean, you're seeing these weird trends all over social media and then this huge spike in number of students and like young people who are saying they're non-binary and they have all these weird sexual proclivities because it's like the popular thing right now. I mean, we've seen fads before, but I think, you know, the people who typically fall into those fads usually have identity crisis problems, right? Like they usually are going through some sort of Well, look family at anorexia. Family. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you, they're usually when I was family kid, stress. When I was, yeah, when I was right. younger. Yeah. yeah. Eating disorders. Yeah. Other psychological disorders, behavioral disorders. That's usually indicative of an unhealthy family environment or that you just don't have like a strong foundation. So you're kind of experimenting and exploring all of these different characteristics that you're not sure about. But that's usually one, relegated to a small percentage of the country. And two, it, it used to be something that was temporary and fleeting. Um, but now because of social media um, and because of, in, in my opinion, a serious lack of identity in this country, you have people breaking themselves into these groups with this obsession with victimhood and wanting to be in the minority and wanting to like just go along with a lot of this stuff to be special and unique um, and different. Um, and they're becoming so obsessed that they're chopping off body parts now. And this is permanent damage. You know, if you were going through a goth phase in high school, you know, that it was just like, okay, makeup you wore, and... yeah, you maybe had a few extra piercings where you didn't want right. to have them down, you know, as an adult. I only or wore you got black a in high school. I only right. wore black. Yeah. Or yeah, or you, you got a tattoo or something like, and you're like kind of, oh, I regret doing that in my teenage years. But now it's like permanent, permanent damage. Like you will never be able to have children. I hope you stick with this decision because you're never going to be able to have children because like, and, and so again, so like we don't have to go into that rabbit hole, but I think this all speaks to a serious identity crisis where students feel like there is a void and, you know, young people feel there is a void. They're aware of the fragility on the one hand. Right. And that on of the of their, you know, whether it's opinions or values or core identity or whatever, I think that that they're aware of the fragility as we were at that age, yeah. um, and as I sometimes am, you know, I got, I mean, I tell my students all the time, you know, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, and I'm almost sixty, <laughs> so you know, like, yeah. uh, you know, we still experience those, and and going through those periods. Um, allowing yourself to talk to other people, expose those vulnerabilities, learn and everything. It's going to make the next, the next identity crisis. And it might just be, you know, maybe when you, um, you know, when your children leave the nest or yeah. you get seriously ill or you have a major injury in sports and you can't, so your identity as a, as an athlete, all of yeah. that work is, is, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I, f I almost feel sometimes like I'm, I'm looking out at just sort of zombies in the classroom. Mm. I feel, I don't feel the same connection. Now, certainly there's a few, don't get me wrong. There's always, right. a, you know, a few, sure. it used to be the opposite though, where I yeah. felt connected to the majority of students and the, and then there were a few sort of, you know, uh, on the fringe. I felt like they were connected to, they were at school for, you know, to learn, to do some of this work that needs to be yeah. done after high school and before you, you know, before you're, you're, you get settled in a career or buy a house or whatever. Right. Um, and, and now I, I feel it's like, look, I paid my money, give me the grade, <laughs> get me the degree and I'm, you know, I'm out of here. And, um, it's, I think it's infiltrating, uh, and I do think this is related to free speech. I'm going to get there. I think it's it's yeah. infiltrating at all levels. So it's it's also administrative um, mm -hmm. to some extent. Sort of like, look, we're paying you a lot of money to just, you know, like you said, go in there, give your lecture, just like go through the motions and get out of there. Don't cause any trouble. Don't make it. Don't make it. Don't offend anybody. Don't just right. just 
do it and get out. And we're, and for that job, I mean, we don't get paid a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. But for, for the job we're asking you to do, which is essentially the, just the basics, don't challenge anybody, just give everybody at least a C and you know, there's a lot of great inflation. So we're, mm. I've always gotten it from the bottom up, right? The bottom mm -hmm. up great, you know, sort of like, oh, you know, I've got a lot going on. I couldn't do that homework assignment or whatever. Now that's everybody's got a lot, you know. Um, but we're also, I, I feel also squeezed from the top. I feel yeah. so. Um, and I do think this is, it, it's really, I don't, I, I mean, I, I mentioned to you that I sort of wanted to talk about maybe the new Princeton principles or the Chicago principles. And I don't get the impression that anyone at the bottom or the top is really that, they might be interested in, <laughs> in having them on their website yeah. or maybe a little like newspaper article that says, you know, they're, you know, we endorse these or whatever. I don't get the idea that, you know, that there's really a lot of buy-in um, and, and a lot of real interest in, in exploring what that might mean on campus. So I don't know yeah. if you, if you've noticed a difference between campuses that have these principles in place, or if, if you think it's pretty much everywhere. I mean, there are, there are very subtle and nuanced differences on some of these campuses like university of Chicago versus at Harvard, for example, where they're, <laughs> you're gonna see a much more balanced curriculum at University of Chicago, much more balanced faculty and administration and student body, because that's kind of understood going in. But I think we should remind ourselves the founding of Chicago really was in retaliation to um, Harvard's anti-Semitism. So I think from the birth of University of Chicago, they've always kind of been you know, in that kind of mindset of like, we are going to be all accepting, all inclusive. Um, now, uh, that doesn't that doesn't mean that University of Chicago gets to like get a write off and that they're never going to be held accountable for any of this stuff because look university wide I think when we're talking about what speech is targeted right now and what speech is chilled and censored um, we are primarily looking at conservative speech because if you look at there's been a number of studies through faculty and administrators that have shown that almost I think it's like 98 percent of faculty and administrators vote for the Democratic Party and donate to the Democratic Party versus the Republican Party. And, you know, the student body generally tends to be more liberal than conservative. So conservatives tend to be more in the minority. So if there's an unpopular popular as in like the, the minority opinion on campus, it's going to be the conservative ideas, the conservative opinions. But in saying all of that, it really that's always how it's been. And we're seeing sudden all of a sudden it's becoming much, much, much worse and more toxic on campus against these ideas and against other divergent viewpoints um, more than ever before. So and it's not always even, been like that. And it doesn't right. even have to be conservative now. Right. Essentially, now it's, you just can't, you're just not left enough. Right. Well, this is the thing is like we've seen topics that were never partisan issues before become incredibly partisan. My topic of free speech, I've been protested at universities because of coming, you know, saying that people should not be compelled to uh, use and espouse ideas that they don't believe in. And that is a fundamental right of our first, you know, outlined in our First Amendment. Um, but people will say that free speech is hate speech now and that free speech is right. now a right wing concept, a right wing idea. And I'm like, this is crazy because the left during the civil rights movement and the college campuses were the core of the free speech movement at the time. So when we're, you know, so these ideas have shifted and we have to ask ourselves why, and I can get into that too, because I do believe it has to do with totalitarian pensions of, of the, of what the, the kind of this woke orthodoxy is demanding of students and administrators. Um, but I want to mention on, on this, the, directly to your question for Chicago and these Princeton principles and whatnot, these are, um, these do help kind of give students some ammunition in protecting their rights on private campuses. Uh, so one thing I do inform students is, look, there's not, private universities are not as beholden to the constitution in the same way public schools are, because public schools are extensions of the state, state, they're taxpayer funded, they're government employees, they have to abide by the constitution and the law. Um, but private, you know, universities are, you know, like, just like private companies, they can state their mission, they can state in their student handbooks and in their principles that they outline what their views are and if those slightly contradict to you know free speech and free expression rules like with religious institutions or religious universities 
when the student is essentially agreeing to those parameters when they go onto those campuses. However, if a school has the Chicago Principles of Free Expression stated that they are signed up on there and that they have, you know, they support these ideas, they support the First Amendment, they'll protect your free speech rights, but then turn around and have a biased reporting system or a harassment policy that targets your constitutionally protected speech, then you as a student actually have something called private right of action where you can sue the university, not for violating your rights necessarily, but more for violating their contract with you. And mm -hmm. so because that is an agreement that the university has made and you have a payer, payee and payer contract. Um, so there are some paths that those types of statements open up for students. Um, however, across the board on university campuses, it's bad for free speech. Like I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's, it's not looking good right now. Um, there are, you know, it, the university system is like a behemoth. I always describe it as like this ginormous thing. They have these billion dollar endowments. They are incredibly well resourced. They have their own internal legal teams. They have administrators and faculty who will toe the line if they need to. Um, and so it's a matter of saying like, how do you kind of, how do you break this down? The best way I describe it is you have to chip away at it slowly. It's not going to happen overnight. We've talked about the long march through the institutions that the far left has accomplished. And education system is one of those institutions that have been completely taken over by a certain ideological premise. And, you know, because that is, again, when we're looking at centers of power and in, in influencing a society, education is definitely the front lines to that. And education is where you get to mold young minds try to indoctrinate them, try to express your ideas upon them and you know, impress your ideas upon them and get them to kind of toe your, your political agenda line. That's not what our university system should be used well, for. Well, I do obviously. want to push back a little bit against yeah, that because yeah, yeah. I don't think, I mean, I mean, I, I, at least I've always prided myself on my students not knowing my political orientation yeah. during, you know, so I, I don't, I really don't believe that the majority of college professors are trying to indoctrinate students into anything. I do believe, however, that many of them believe that they are doing the social justice version of God's work. You know, if I can mm. say, you know, they're, they're doing good, they're doing part of good service like there's the oh this is part of caring about our students this is part of nurturing this is part i don't believe that they're trying to indoctrinate i believe that they're they i believe they believe <laughs> that they're yeah. doing something um you know that's uh that's i don't i don't know it I, like i said just caring and loving saying. and and stuff yeah. and so they're incorporating a lot of this decolonizing, you know, anti-racist stuff into, you know, I mean, we have a whole department to anti-racist your syllabi and I look at it and I'm like, I can't, I don't see any anti-racism here. I don't see, I don't yeah. know where it is. This looks very much like, it's like, oh, include your office hours. No kidding. You know, I, I don't know what the, <laughs> so, um, but they're, they want to call it that that's, that's sort of a social signaling thing, right? Like, look at me going to an anti-racist blah, 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 or look at me, you know, decolonizing by, you know, you know, using, uh, primary sources from other, you know, uh, researchers from other countries and, and stuff. Um, but I do, so, but I do think, and I think that they're teaching universities are teaching teachers to do this as well. Yeah. Not to indoctrinate, but because they are, they're, they're sort of leaning into this, you know, equity thing because it's, it's good, it's loving, it's good. And, and we're, we are service oriented and we want to be all inclusive and that kind of thing. So I don't really, I don't yeah. believe that there's some kind of conspiracy to, to, you know, like indoctrinate students. So, I'm not saying that no one would yeah. ever do that. I just right. don't think it's and a that's, widespread So that's thing. the thing is I wouldn't say it's like this large grand conspiracy either. I do think you're right. There are a lot of professors and faculty out there who are just like very true to themselves and they're going to teach what they want to teach regardless of all of this nonsense that's happening in the background. And they do care about their students. However, I do think there is an environment on campus right now that if those professors were told to toe the line that they would because and they wouldn't push back because they would be afraid of losing their jobs. Right. They would be afraid oh, yeah, of being lambasted. Your, your on, colleagues yeah. will abandon you. Right. I mean, exactly. I'm, I'm evidence of that. I mean, if you if you don't do, you know, exact thus and so if you don't go to the blah, blah, blah training. And if right. you don't do this on, on their schedule when they say to do it and and all that kind of thing, you know, your no colleague will 
will so back I you up, even if they believe. Yeah. Right. And I think that that is very much evidence of what is actually going on when you think about how totalitarian regimes operate. Uh, you, it's, the people who are kind of towing the line, they're not necessarily the ones that are seeking and like to indoctrinate the youth. They're the ones who are just creating the opportunities for the ones who do have political agendas to properly indoctrinate the youth. And I think at this point where we are right now, actually most of the indoctrination has already taken place by the time students get to campus. In K through 12, uh, we just I just saw an article the other day in the New York Post about a report that came out where they looked at 70 districts across the country uh, for you know public school districts and their hiring practices have altered and that now the way that they interview teachers, they ensure that they have essentially political litmus tests in, instilled in the hiring process. Um, you know, side, that's aside from the DEI statements that they're often forced and required to sign. In addition to that, they, they now put, you know, people of the, L, members of the LGBTQ community and uh, minorities on these interview panels in order to act as political litmus testers for the people that they're interviewing. And so when when I when I talk to a lot of students, a lot of this, the damage is done by the time they get to college with like how compliant they're willing to be. And that's really what worries me the most because when we talk about American culture and American society, the reason we were founded, the reason we split from, uh, from Great Britain, the reason we pushed back and challenged is because we, we had this like skepticism, this very healthy level of skepticism of power. And anyone who was in a position of power, we were willing to question. And then if they said we couldn't question them, then we went, we fought them. You know, we fought for this right to be able to question and to be skeptical of authority. And we are losing our grip on that skepticism. I don't think students really have that at all coming out of K through 12. Mm -hmm. They believe that every administrator and every university has their, their best interests at heart that the only reason that they have rules against things like microaggressions is because they're just trying to protect students. The reason they have the land acknowledgement is because they're just trying to be nice and caring. And yeah, that there is a, an, an angle of that that is probably true. But the problem is we should be asking ourselves, like, why? Why do you need to control every single aspect of our lives? Why do you need to control every thought in our mind? Why do you need to control every word that we speak? Why do... Because that is what totalitarian regimes need. It's a, need. It's a zero-sum game when it comes to uh, power and control. If someone has power, if, if you as, as an individual have uh, power over yourself, if you have agency, then that is power that the government doesn't have over you, right? So when you think about these tactics, we've seen these tactics used. I'm not saying that the entire government right now in the United States is totalitarian, but what I'm, what I'm worried about is we're seeing evidence of it. We're seeing habits and pensions being right. expressed. Not, always per, not like a purposeful conspiracy thing, but just sort right. of, and you know, you we're mentioned the, that act, activity right. happening through these systems where student, people are supposed to be reporting on each other and right. that you ha you're being required to use certain language. You have to acknowledge certain things and, you know, pledge to certain things. That is those, that is tactics that those are tactics that have been used historically by totalitarian right. regimes for this purpose. Right. And whether it's being weaponized at this point, who knows, right. but yeah. So you mentioned that I, I wanted to come back to, you know, you mentioned the Stasi and now we can talk about the you know, <laughs> right. report. Well, no, there's a, there's an actual, re there's a research article and it's like a little, it's beyond, some of it is mathematically beyond me. Okay. Mm -hmm. But what the, what these researchers did was they went into um, areas that were informing on each other um, after <clears throat> in in uh, East and West Germany uh, hmm. before the wall, uh, you know, in this you know sort of informing on each other, and they um, they looked at um, uh, you know trust, well being, um, you know person, no, I don't want to say person, um, uh, issues of, of thriving in your own community. Oh, okay. Yeah, interesting. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, including, and they, and they included, um, economic, uh, measures. And so what they found was that even after all of this time, areas where there was more, and this is where it's beyond me, the mathematical part where they did the, the geo, uh, you know, the, the geography, <laughs> you know, GIS, ge ge geographic oh, yeah, that, information yeah, yeah. system stuff. It's, it's mathematically, uh, beyond me, <laughs> but what they, they looked at was proximity, right. And how, <laughs> um, you know, areas that were contiguous with, uh, areas that were 
more or less on the info. So that we have maybe like high, you know, a high degree of informing. We have low degree of informing on one another. And then we have these places that are kind of in between. Hmm. And they found really clear differences where the, where there was plenty of informing. We have low trust. We have poorer, uh, poorer people. Um, hmm. We have uh, people who are in, um, in shorter term uh, relationships. Uh, you know, I mean, this aspect has been, you know, sort of, a, you know, handed down, you know, through whatever stories you're raising your kids. And it's like, you don't, you know, don't trust everybody, everything you hear. Don't trust yep. people, you know, whatever. Grandpa might not really be on uncle George might not really be on our side, whatever. Um, and that, so it, it affected economics. It affected people's relationships. It affected their trust in government, local and national. Mm -hmm. um, and it affected interpersonal trust in terms of, you know, their, their close relationships and their more distant ones and the places in between. So those were kind of con not contiguous, um, but I'm sorry, contiguous with both tended mm -hmm. to adopt the, the, they were, they were less mistrustful, but still more. So even yeah. though there wasn't high informing in that area, they were exposed to the high informing, you know, uh, uh sort of areas. So that's really uh, interesting. It's just one yeah. study. It's just one yeah. study, but it was, it was an interesting way to study society to look back on what it looks like when you have uh, uh, people who are informing on one another in order to, I mean, this wasn't to, to gain social media points, but it was, you know, essentially to get, um, you know, to get, to gain credibility yeah. with other people. And, and it just, I mean, all these years later, it's still impacting people's well being. Uh, that's amazing. And that's what I mean, we that we should really take a lesson from that, because that's what we're going to see in these generations of students who have been going to campuses. And I, something that's really, really scary about bias reporting systems is that students are actually using them and students are using them the very regularly. And we so we did a report last or a study last year to look at I think we looked at over 800 university campuses, private and public, and found that 56 percent of them have bias reporting systems on them. And of the schools that we've sued, that's where we've seen some of the most egregious um, reporting systems where they really do target students' constitutionally protected speech and discipline them for it. Um, we found that students use them very, very often for even the smallest things. So social media posts, we've seen people uh, report on someone for posting like a puke face emoji um, against someone's like Black Lives Matter hashtag. We've seen students report each other for writing something on the whiteboard that they disagreed with for laughing at a joke. Um, every what, What's scary is that their default, and this is what the university is aiming at with these types of policies, there's really no other reason to have this policy. They want the default for the students to be if they hear an offensive idea or an idea that they disagree with, their immediate reaction should be to report it to a figure of authority rather than to actually engage with it. And so that is what's terrifying is that's what we're training them to do right now. And they're falling in line, like I said, because they do a lot of them. I've talked to a lot of students and just kind of done like these man on the street interviews and ask them like, what's, you know, what's going on? Why do you feel like, you know, even if you want more open discussion in the classroom, you feel like all of these policies are okay on your campus. And they, they firmly believe in a lot of ways that this is that the university has their best interests at heart and that they like that these are figures of authority that know best and that they know what's best for the students in order to be successful. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of concerns there where it's like there's like this apathy or this complacency among students where they do think that this is an OK way to operate and they're not pushing back at Virginia Tech's campus. And I've seen this at a couple other schools, too, down in North Carolina and some other areas. They actually have signs in all their classrooms that say, see something, say something. And they're not wow. talking about, yeah, they're not talking about backpacks after 9-11, like right. we're used to seeing that. They are talking about if you see anything that's remotely suspicious, you need to report it. That is so Stasi. That is so Orwellian. I like can't even, and this is so normalized on campus. That's the thing that's terrifying is that students do not think this is crazy. They think this is just the normal every day. I walk in a classroom, oh, see something, say something. Okay, yeah, I'll make sure to do that. Uh, and that's that's really what it is. There's no well, like you said, then they don't ever learn how to intervene. Instead, they just right. learn how to either report or film, stand around and film while somebody's yes. while somebody's dying on the street. They just mm -hmm. film it for crying yeah. out loud. I yeah. mean, 
you know, and so if you don't do the little things, if you don't learn to interact in the small ways, how can you ever hope to act in a big way and yeah. really make a difference in the world? And most college students would say that they want to make a difference in the world. You got to practice that. You got to practice yeah. that in the little ways. Take right. baby steps. And then, you know, but if you're always just, you know, crying, so it's, you know, we, we, we criticize little kids. I mean, you're always crying to your mom, you know, for get up. No, no yeah. autopsy, no foul. Get up, you know. So you put a bandaid on it. Move on, right. you know. And it creates so much division because how students see their peers now, they see their peers as potential enemies. They see right. their peers as like someone who's not. You're not in this together for four years. It used to be kind of like let's all get together and like study and you know at and graduation. You're like, dude, yeah, I can't believe we got through this. That was an amazing four years. Good job, everyone. And you're just kind of come together. There's like a real sense of camaraderie and fellowship there that just really doesn't exist anymore because you have a lot of students who are constantly looking over their shoulders, wondering if someone's going to report them or they're walking on eggshells, you know, afraid to say something in the classroom, afraid to say something in a, in a large setting. They all group together in these tiny, very trusting groups and they don't stray from those at all yeah. because they are afraid to engage with one another. And so it creates that sense of enmity on campus. And we looked, when we saw how many students were using these reporting mechanisms on campus, we did another study. We looked at, we FOIA'd a bunch of universities across the campus asking for their freshman orientation materials because we're like, what are you telling, what are you telling them? Like, why are they, why are they so keen on reporting on one another? And we found that 91% of the materials covered these, what we call DEI theme topics. Mm -hmm. And that's everything that we talked about earlier. So diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, climate change, uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, anti-racism, white privilege, all the topics you can think of that kind of but fall under that speech, category. But not free speech, right? But not free speech. We found that only 30% of the schools that we surveyed found or, or even mentioned free speech or viewpoint diversity once. And of those 30% of schools that mentioned it at least once, it was still a seven to one ratio mm -hmm. of how much DEI themed topics they were covering versus free speech and viewpoint diversity. So students are coming out just in the first year thinking, Oh, I got to be careful. You know, mm -hmm. I've, I've got to like, watch what I say. I've got to be ready to be like offended and report it. And I have all these resources available to me to report things. But the last thing on their mind is like, oh, by the way, free speech is a really important value in the United States. And these are all the reasons why uh, they don't even have that thought. It's not even right. the kernel's not even there. So <laughs> they're on the lookout to report on each other before they right. even consider having a discussion. Yeah. And, you know, um, there is a, by the way, there's a map. I know you know this, but there's a map <laughs> on your website where yeah. you can uh, look for places that have these reporting systems. And I was, I, I explored that yesterday mm -hmm. and I was uh, shocked at how many, I was just uh, blew my mind. And, yeah. and some of our sister, my, like in my little state system, some of the others have it. And again, my university was my department was trying to do it. And when I started mm -hmm. to ask questions, one of the things I, I don't think people are asking questions, what are you going to, what's going to happen to that information? You know, and right. you start asking professors, so should they, should you be able to use it in a, in a tenure um, review? Well, right. not if it's my tenure review, but if it's your tenure review, yeah. sure. Right. Again, this, this inability to sort of, you know, take a dip, take someone else's perspective as you mentioned, you know, I mean, I don't know if it's 98% of faculty that are, that are truly left-leaning. They might, um, you know, might more, might over-report their left, uh, their leftist tendencies <laughs> again as part of the, uh, but, you know, research keeps find we keep finding, so for a while it was the left, left-leaning people who would not, who would sit, who said that they would not even sit next to a person that they knew was uh, uh, you know, had a different political political orientation. They would not hmm. even sit at lunch with someone who had a different political orientation. An overwhelming number of left leaning professors said that they would not sit. sit. Now we're finding that they do. You know, they've done follow up studies and they're finding pretty equally that right leaning. Yeah. There's not that many right leaning. As you point out, there are fewer of them, but even when they use sort of you know a sliding scale, and it's not you know one or the other, but they you know, it's, it's, it's coming, it's now so that, you know, people won't even sit. Ne These are adult right. people with PhDs will not sit next to each other at lunch. It's, they say it, that yeah. they won't approve. They, they would be disinclined to approve a grant application mm -hmm. that was investigating a hypothesis that they disagreed with, that they thought might be harmful. Seriously, how can we study what 
I mean, let's just take let's just take it at face value that let's just say that people are system that there's systemic racism. Let's just mm -hmm. say that that's a fact. Don't you believe that if that if we were to if we want to get rid of this, that we better study it? And if we're going to study it, it might offend someone. While well, we're studying, studying, but studying the safest, requires questioning. Yes, and the <laughs> safest place to study sort of what you what you think is the ugly side of mm -hmm. human behavior and human personality would be where in a research setting. This would be right. a safe place to study something that was potentially offensive, that was potentially ugly um, part of, of human nature and human behavior. Uh, so when you prevent people from talking about things, they're not going to research them. When you, you people are afraid to you know, apply for a research grant right. to study these things, we're not expanding it. So even if you really believe that there's systemic racism and that we need to address it, then you then you're not behaving in ways that demonstrate that because you're actually thwarting discussion, you're thwarting right. research, you're thwarting these interactions and and sharing of knowledge that would facilitate moving forward. So are you so afraid that it's not there that you won't talk about? I well, don't know. I think that's honestly the reality is that a lot of these ideas, these concepts of like anti that's come out of this anti-racism, you know, rhetoric and and way of looking at the world are they are seen as established ideas they are seen as settled ideas and that's on purpose because look we there are a number of studies that have traced these ideas all the way back to marxist professors and yes. academics who like came in talking about critical race theory you know critical gender theory and all these various kind of ideas about categorizing people in breaking people into these kind of groups these identity groups right um and experimenting with them in that in that way and so but I, the reality is, and I think we all really know this, this is the thing, it's like, we all know that just because you look a certain way doesn't mean your behavior is going to match another person who looks similar looks to way. you. Yeah. yeah, that's just, there are so many other factors involved with the type of person that you become. Uh, and, and that's just like, that's, it's, it's, it's unprovable. And so this is something that you can't, if you, if you question it too much, it'll start to break down the narrative and they just can't afford that. So I'm not saying again, like that there's a big conspiracy of it, but there is a reason why it's already Becoming a you know, habit of thought, basically yeah, it's a habit of thought. It's saying that this is a settled issue. There's no reason right. to do additional research on it because it's settled. Now I've heard it from a number of professors too, who want to apply for grants. Um, and look, the, and most people don't realize this, but, and I'm sure you do though, is that part of the way to get tenure is to be able to show you can bring in money through research grants and that you can actually publish and get your name out there and, and establish yourself. Well, a lot of research grants nowadays, especially the ones that come through the government, are going to ask you to explain how your research benefits underrepresented minorities or how it benefits the LGBTQ community or, you know, whatever. And I had a, um, a geosciences professor that I had on my podcast uh, from University of, I think it was Arkansas, and he mentioned that he actually... I, he just he wanted to study a crater and like how this crater expanded over time and he was required to put a section in on how his research yes. would benefit minorities and he was like you know we all just copy and paste it blindly and we all just have something that internally faculty send around like oh just copy and paste this but at the end of the day that's that's horrible that's really gonna that is going to be a serious detriment to our scientific advancement when we are like we are weighting everything down with all of this rhetoric and all of these expectations on that side of things. Again, it comes down to why is there such an effort? Why is there such a desire to actually decrease our proficiencies in science and math and, and reading and writing when we start to look at what schools are prioritizing with DEI, but they're not prioritizing reading skills or writing skills or math skills. Students or reading are coming, the constitution, as you pointed or out. Reading the constitution. One... Yeah. Well, I know. Yeah. I, um, I go to campuses all the time and ask students like, hey, you know, you're adults now. You have autonomy and agency over your rights. You're responsible for standing up for them. How many of you read the Constitution, which laid the foundational principles for our entire legal system? How many of you read it? Because you're going to be operating in this system. You're going to have to be beholden to it. 
Um, almost none of them have read the Constitution by the time they get to college. It's terrifying. I think I was at a campus of 50, you know, usually it's like five out of 50 will raise their hand. And even those five are kind of like, oh, I read the Bill I of Rights. I think I did. It was, yeah. A, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was like that one time. Yeah. They don't study it seriously. They're not taking it seriously. And that is so, so bad for, for our legal, for our, our, the future of our country, because again, everything that our legal system is built on, everything that our political system is built on is these foundational, are these foundational principles. And one thing I also try to stress to students is we don't have a demographic culture in this country. We have a political one because that is what we were born out of. We were born out of this idea of creating a system of government uh, that is very unique and was incredibly unique at the time, but also challenged the status quo for what that should look like and stat uh, challenged the status quo for things like natural rights and, you know, who, who we are principally as a people. And, you know, it, it, there's a, there's a desire to avoid controversy by avoiding political discussions, by avoiding ideological discussions, but that's fundamentally who we are as, as Americans. And it's built into every aspect of our culture. So we really need to understand the rules, the laws, and kind of what all of that was about. Um, and so there are there are universities that are trying to establish these constitutional centers, civic centers, um, but it is still very disturbing how few students in K through 12 are getting this education on those topics, because again, that will lay the groundwork, like we were talking about with free speech, it will lay the groundwork for how students are engaging with one another on campus, how they're uh, pushing back once they start to recognize if their rights are being violated on those campuses. And then that will ultimately lead them down this, this kind of discourse filled path where they are challenging ideas and being challenged. And there's like that really healthy back and forth uh, amongst them. So one thing I want to mention is because you mentioned this earlier, uh, we're talking about like where they were storing the reports of bias response teams. That is something that is ever present on students' minds, especially when they've been called in and reported. Uh, there is a huge concern of like, like the universities are not transparent about this at all. We've had a hard time figuring out what they do with these reports. They don't throw them away. They're certainly storing them and holding on to them for investigative purposes, but they're definitely doing it for tracking purposes too. In fact, a lot of them will openly admit that they're just using these as a tracking system to see how many people are essentially a you know, bullying or offending each other on campus just to kind of track it. Why are you tracking this stuff? You know, what are you going to use it for down the road? Are you going to use it, like you mentioned, for tenure reviews? Are you going to use it when, when maybe one of your students decides to run for political office down the road? Is that going to resurface suddenly about some sort of comment they made that offended someone? Uh, students are very aware of what could be with the repercussions of putting things online, being called a racist online, being called a bigot online, what the, the consequences of that are, because they very much, like we mentioned, live online. So something that is at very much at the forefront of their minds is what happens if my, my prospective employer Googles me? This right. is part of the reason why they keep their heads down on campus because they do not, the last thing they need, they're, they're paying you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a job, essentially. Uh, the last thing they need is to have an employer Google them and see that they said something on social media and a bunch of people called them racist and that they come with this baggage. Uh, that is that is ever present on their minds. So yes, an, an anonymous tracking system for you making comments will certainly silence and chill speech on campuses for sure. Yeah. And I, I just want to say, you know, I've had students come up to me after class, mm -hmm. students of color who have said, I don't feel like I can say thus okay. and so because, um, because other students of color would condemn me for that. I had a student of color in one of my classes, it was on language. <laughs> And, uh, and so, and, uh, you know, she said, you know, I, I like the, the music that I like, my friends say isn't black enough. So here's a black student <laughs> saying her friends are saying, so it isn't just happening, you know, it like, I think sometimes we think of it just happening to say, like you said, right, you know, right leaning white, mm -hmm. maybe even white males, right. Right. Uh, cisgender white males, you know, right leaning, <laughs> but it yeah. is, it, as you, it, you know, it, it is affecting everyone. It is even preventing people who might speak out about something that the maybe the woke would agree with. Yeah. But they're afraid of speaking because it might not be said exactly the right way or it might not be 
enough of whatever it is. Again, you know, maybe like, oh, my music isn't enough of mm -hmm. what's expected of me. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm expected to, you know, maybe I would like to critique this study on something that isn't just about, uh, you know, the participant, the, you know, there wasn't enough of some, some race in the study. I'd like to actually talk about some other part of it, but then you would be criticized for, it's like, well, no, we already, we already said this study is not worth talking about because of that. And now you still want to talk about it. So it isn't, it's, yeah. it's happening across the board. Like you said, it's, it's, yes all faculty members, it's all students. And I do think it's insidious. I do think that people just don't yeah. even know that they're doing it and they're not actively engaged in some kind of conspiracy. They're just, like you said, they're just towing the line. They're just right. doing what everyone, this is what, there, there's real live advantages yeah. to conforming. There yes. are actual advantages to conforming. And so, you know, when we're constantly reminded of all of those advantages and constantly reminded of the disadvantages of not conforming, then we don't get to explore the learning that comes with the non-conforming because we're naturally going to kind of like yeah, be conformist. Sure. And so yeah. when you just hammer at that all the time, you're just <laughs> never going to get anything different. Conforming is the path of least resistance. So right. that's where most people are going to gravitate towards. And it's safety. Towards. And it it's comes safety. from, it comes and from evolution. Yeah. And I mean, there's, right. there's lots and of there's good reasons. Lot, for it. Yeah. There's, when it comes to like a civil society, there's a lot that we do right. conform on. And this hey, is if why. If none of us ever stopped yeah. at a stoplight, we'd be in, you know, right. it would be a mess, exactly. right? Yeah. Conform, we conform every day, all day Even long. Even societal we norms. Like right. when, when we talk about, it's so interesting because when we talk about speech protections and how free speech is in this country, you know, the Supreme Court has ruled time and time again that there's actually no hate speech or offensive speech exception to the First Amendment of the Constitution. And that's because of the, something I outlined earlier, which was this concern for when you create a law around a subjective and overbroad idea or phrasing, you are going to open that law up to selective enforcement and discrimination, where whoever's the enforcer for that law is going to basically determine amongst themselves whether or not what you said fits into that category. It needs to be specific. But one thing is, is you don't see people, it's still a huge faux pas to go around throwing racial slurs. You don't need what? a law to stop right. that because people for since the beginning of time have always been able to disassociate themselves with people they found rude, disrespectful, abhorrent. You know, if, if you say something that I don't like or appreciate, I might argue with you about it, or I might just walk away and not right. engage. You don't need and a law now, for me to know. Disassociation is, right. is socially painful. And exactly. so, and, and, you know, I mean, we could talk about how that's weaponized in cancellation, but that yeah. only shows how, how visceral and how real it is and how the cons constant concern. And, and so, but yeah, I mean, we have that option of, of, just disengaging from someone, you know, we right. don't, and we don't have to punish that. We don't have to put their name on a billboard that says, you know, I'm right. Uh, I'm, you know, um, but there's something about even like the, like unfriending someone that is just like, it's like, really? Cause I just like, didn't, I just said hi, but didn't eat lunch with them anymore or whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah. That, this comes back know. down to the dehumanization aspect. Yeah. So like you can disassociate with someone that you find offensive but you're, and you're going to like walk away from them, but to seek out punishment for them, to seek out societal punishment for them is something that requires a lot of vitriol and a lot of hate. And in order to feel that way about people, you must probably, it's, it's going to be a lot easier if you don't really see their human side. And this comes right. back down to social media and online presence. Um, and one thing you mentioned earlier with, with kind of people within these groups wanting to dissent even just slightly from the mainstream norm of what everyone's saying, but feeling like that if they did, all of a sudden they'd be completely disowned by these groups that they value um, being part of. I was one of our students that um, is, you know, she's, she's participating in one of our lawsuits. She's, she's actually a lesbian and she's part of the LGBTQ community on campus. Um, but she really doesn't like that her bathroom is shared by men and that if they have these, they have unisex bathrooms, like everyone can mm. use them. And so she's not pro trans. She's kind of very much against that, but it's 
primarily because she's very uncomfortable going into these bathrooms and having men in her bathroom. So are the, the dormitories all unisex bathrooms now? Uh, the... Not not every campus, but a lot of campuses. Okay. Okay. A lot of campuses that have um, have like shared sex dorms. Like if you have okay. like men and women on the same floor. Now part and so she yeah it really makes her uncomfortable when she walks yeah, in her bathroom. I, I wouldn't like that. <laughs> I wouldn't want my. A lot of parents don't know about this. I'm sure they would be very uncomfortable with this if they knew. Um, it's not something schools technically advertise, like really advertise. Um, but she was talking about to me about how she just cannot express this viewpoint at all. On, because mm. all of her friends would call her a transphobe, would say that she's you know hurting their community by thinking this way. She'd be completely disowned by every friend that she has, um, and that's so sad that like you can't just present this basic issue that you have that makes you uncomfortable because you know that you'll be disowned by your group. And she, I'll tell you this, the fear is real. And I get a lot of um, responses from people who've been out of college for, for, for years now, for decades and say, oh, students just need to suck it up. They just yes. need to like be brave. Yes. And I'm like, sure. Yes, there is. There are definitely, I tell students, you need to be courageous because it's contagious. And that is so important when you speak up in a classroom, when you're the one pushing back, other students will see that and will want to be part of it. You know, they'll, they'll realize that they're not alone anymore in the way that they've been thinking. That's important. But there are, these students are actually very terrified. Like this is not an easy uh, hurdle to overcome. She was on the phone with me telling me her story and she relocated at least five times while she was talking to me. And she was whispering the entire time. Wow. And she was outside on campus. She yeah. was terrified. Someone right. would hear her thoughts think that she was conservative. She was terrified. I have students who tell me that they don't wear cowboy, like Texas students tell me that they don't wear cowboy boots to class if they know their professor is a liberal because they are afraid they'll be associated with conservatism. You know, and, and let me just say for all any college yeah. students who are listening, we don't care. <laughs> Yeah, we, this is we just thing. don't like, care. You know, most so, professors so, probably don't care. No, but we don't this care. Weird, but, but they're the terrified. Idea, yeah. the, exactly. Yeah. But so that's the real issue: is that that somehow it's been it's been you know sort of a little idea has been implanted mm -hmm. in their minds. You know that we care what you're wearing or whether we care we we and I don't care what you call yourself. I'll call but you, you any. Have yeah, I don't, I, say, I don't care. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm interested. There are some campuses oh, there are. where. Uh, there are, yeah. yes. And I just don't think it's the majority. I think no, most of us don't not. care what you're doing. It's certainly not. But be, oh, part of the reason social media, look, the worst stories are going yes. to reach the most ears. And yes. so, and that's always kind of been the case, you know, historically, but social media just makes it happen so much faster. Oh, yes. And uh, with yes. larger groups. And so we had a student, for example, who was wearing a MAGA hat on campus and he was punched in the face by a black woman, a black fellow student. And she was female. And, and so like, he obviously didn't expect it, but she just straight up went up to him, started screaming in his face and punched him. And based on the identity group that she belonged to versus him, he's a white male. Uh, he, she he actually, yeah. yeah, she won. Well, he didn't report it. He didn't even, it was oh, physical wow. assault. And right. he was afraid that because he was wearing that hat, that he right. would be accused of instigating the problem and right. that he would actually get punished. And so he never reported that to his campus administrators. But this is the level of fear that they're operating in. They, they do believe there are real consequences. Like we talked about online being called a racist or a bigot that will affect your, that could easily affect your career and your, your job prospects. Um, but there's also just like this, you know, there's, uh, there was a student, I just interviewed him for my podcast, C.B. Giarno. He went to a, um, a Christian liberal arts college in Tennessee, like of all places. And he was, uh, he, he posted something online that just said, happy 4th of July. Uh, he was in front of the White House. He was just wearing like a sports hoodie. And he's like, happy 4th of July. Very proud to be an American. This is a great country. And that's it. Uh, he was called a racist and a bigot mm. and he got so many death threats because he was, he, because he posted it July 4th of 2020. And so if everyone, that's when the George Floyd thing was really, yeah. really hot yeah. at the time yeah. and everyone was talking about it. So he was called, he was called, he was a president of a student government association. They, they uh, started a petition to remove him from office um, based on these comments, calling him, saying he was a racist. There was a huge movement on campus. He got so many death threats. He had to get private or he had, he almost had to get private security or security from the state to escort him. The school finally, after enough egging on, finally provided him with campus security. He had to park off campus and be escorted onto campus. And eventually he just started doing virtual classes because it was mm -hmm. getting so bad. But this is, that's insane. Like you, yeah. you're, you're, you're and, fearing for your physical safety just because you said happy 4th of July, I'm proud right. to be an American. And that's I, my, 
I mean, my experience and, and my personal experience, my, you know, the stories that, that, that I've he heard and stuff, I mean, genuinely, I mean, the, the, the schools just want you to shut up and go away. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they're just like, look, we don't, we don't need this in our lives. And we just, you know, so they're not helpful. They might meet with you no, and be not. really like yeah. polite and, and nice and, and, and everything, you know, um, but they're not meeting with you to help resolve the problem they're meeting with you just to sort of you know again to sort yeah. of like get you to go away and get you to you know they're not interested in protecting it's like all of a sudden right it's like all of a sudden then it's like oh well but these students who are posting the, that about you have rights to free speech interesting because that's what i'm saying about what i posted in front of the capitol right like right. that i had the free speech to do that oh no because no, no, but the other students have the right to free speech to condemn you for it. Right. And well, this th is they'll the hide behind I, that. Yeah. yeah. This is an argument I often hear. We've heard it from administrators like presidents of schools. Whenever we write, a, we send a petition letter to them saying that you can't, you know, this is, there is constitutionally protected speech. You can't like shut these students speech based on their viewpoints. Uh, and they'll say, well, the students who are shutting down their speech also have the right to free speech. I'm like, first of all, do you even understand the law? Like, that's not how it works. About, yeah. <laughs> that's not how it works. Yeah, you can't use your speech to shut down. So you can't use your rights to remove someone else's right. rights. You know, that's not how it works. That's not how it's ever designed to work. And that would never hold up in the court of law because that's not a real argument. But oftentimes you do see protesters shouting down speakers saying they're just exercising their free speech rights. If they stop someone from speaking, they are no longer exercising their free speech rights. They're being combative. When you send someone a death threat, that's not free speech. That's a true threat. And that is actually against the law. Um, and so we may not have hate speech laws, but there are restrictions that are really reasonable and rational restrictions on speech in those types of scenarios. And it is amazing. So one thing, you know, we talk a lot about how look, there's a lot of faculty who are just like not interested in being political. They don't want to participate in this and they have the best interests of the students at heart. Um, but there are certain bad actors on the campuses. So it's always interesting to me where you see this kind of weird like division where it's like you do have people who have political agendas in the administrations and they are bad actors. They're trying to push stud egg students on, work with the students that align with them politically to go after students. Sometimes you'll see if you have a very far left leaning student government association, their faculty advisor might be working with the DEI office to like help report to the bias response teams, anyone like the turning point chapter on campus who's tabling about a man is a man and is a woman is a woman. They'll like, they'll work together to conspire to actually report these people to the bias response team. So there are bad actors on campus. You saw oh, Stanford. Sure, yeah. I don't doubt yeah, that at all. Right. Yeah. And you saw Stanford Law School where you have right. the DEI dean like shouting down, the helping a mob shout down a judge. Like right. so there, but I will, it is interesting because you mentioned, yeah, there's a lot of folks who kind of just toe the line because they, they don't really want to rock the boat, but also they're going to, they're, they're, I think they're also afraid to push back on this woke mob. But really what it takes to solve this problem is administrators who, and faculty members who are willing to stand up against that crazy woke mob. That's like really just a small percentage of the campus, usually very, very small, even if they, you know, and they probably aren't that organized, but it's just to, to stand up and be like, no, we stand firm for free speech. You don't get to, you know, you don't get to shout down speakers. You'll be punished if you do. This is the big thing. They'll say you don't get to shout down speakers. We do support the First Amendment. But the actual accountability measures are usually non-existent. Right. And that's really where the administrators should be coming in and saying, no, we stand for free speech. And guess what? You're going to get suspended if you try to do something like this. Right. We're going to we're going to kick you off campus if you throw fireballs at, you know, if you throw fireballs at a, through the window. During, for wearing a baseball yeah, hat. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah. anyway, this is, uh, yeah, it's, it seems like common sense, but it is hard for, and we were talking about the conformity issue. It is really hard for people to break that mentality of conformity. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. So there are things administrators can do. Yes. Just standing by and letting it happen is really not their role on campus. Yeah. But that is what the majority of them do. Right. For faculty yeah. and students, and and I would like to say that you know I, I think uh, I would like to say that other faculty will encourage each other, and you know I would like to say oh yeah stand up somebody else will stand up with you, but unfortunately right now I hope that that will be true, but right now it's it's yeah. not so. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, what can we wait? How can we finish yeah. on a positive note? Because I just was yeah. a real downer. 
Say, no, you're say. right. You're right. I know we get we're really good at, um, at outlining all the problems yes. um, and presenting very few solutions. Yeah, say um, something but, hopeful. No, yeah. The hopeful side is, look, there is in just like the last decade alone, we have seen a, a huge jump in the number of students who are becoming more politically involved, less apathetic, less complacent and much more, whether it be on the left or the right, much more engaged. And I even tell the protesters who are protesting me on the free speech stuff. I'm just glad that you guys care because I see so many students who are not passionate, not engaged, and they just want to get their degree and get out. At least, even if I disagree with you on everything that you believe, at least you're doing something about it. You're engaged enough to like be present at this event and to protest me. And that's sad that the bar is so low these days, (laughs) but, but I think that is a good sign. Um, It's a, you know, it's a good sign that we're actually seeing Gen Zers. There's been a number of articles about this turn off their phones and put screen time limits on their phones and, you know, try to lose their phone on the weekends and not take as many pictures. I think there's going to be a reaction. And I think we're just seeing the very, very beginning stages of it. Just people rejecting social media, hopefully rejecting um, this online presence and engaging with one another more, trying to see where that goes. There has been a jump and religiosity in, in the, you know, in just the recent years um, when we saw like a huge decline. And I think that has a lot to do again, when we were talking about the identity issues, um, people kind of, instead of reacting to the identity issues of doing something very extreme and damaging to yourself, people instead trying to do something more productive with it. So we have seen signs of that. Um, we've got a long uphill battle on this when it comes to college campuses. We are winning. Speech first is winning. So <laughs> that's we are holding bad actors accountable. We are getting bad actors removed from campuses. We're making the universities pay fines when they violate students' rights. We're making them change their policies. We're eliminating these bias response teams. We actually just filed a petition for cert on August 14th to have the Supreme Court hear our bias response team oh. case against Virginia Tech. So we are very excited for that. To get a national ruling on that would be huge to solving, to, to fixing that problem on campus and to getting, to eradicating those once and for all. Um, so there is like, there, there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed when it comes to what's going on on campuses, especially with, with free speech. But like I said, chipping away at it one major battle at a time is going to be our best bet because they have a lot of resources, a lot of money. It's hard to just go at entire university system. You can't just take it down in one fell swoop. There's no magic bullet solution. Um, We have seen state lawmakers get much more involved with free speech concerns on college campuses. That has been part in part because of what we've been doing at Speech First, getting model policies out there to uh, to lawmakers at the state level to help encourage universities and you know hold them accountable for free speech protections on their on their campuses, on the state campuses. We've seen the members of um, Congress on the hills uh, actually get much more involved with free speech and free expression concerns on uh, in, in higher ed. So we are seeing momentum here, and I think it's really important that we see that as a positive because you know your organizations like yours and this podcast, the Dis- the dissidents. I mean, that's a great title for a podcast because that's what we need more of in America: people who are willing to challenge the status quo, people who are skeptical of power and authority, um, because that's what America is all about. And so. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it sounds like we're not we're all like conspiracy theorists, but no, it's like really just about yeah. pushing back and questioning things and yeah, yeah. and having that healthy skepticism. Yeah. So there is a positive, there's a positive there, you know, for your listeners, they can find out more about what we're working on at speechfirst.org and, you know, find me on Twitter, Sharice Trump and, you know, speech first is also on Twitter. We post a lot of our updates there. Uh, but yeah, just if you want to sign up to become a member, you'll get newsletters and kind of updates about what we're working on. You, Elizabeth mentioned earlier that I have a podcast, Well Said, where I bring in guests to talk more about a lot of these issues we touched on today uh, and some of like some of the bigger picture issues of, of culture and free speech and how that fits in. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's always great to have supporters. A big part of what we do is litigation on behalf of our student members. Uh, we do believe that the law is kind of our last line of defense when it comes to a lot of these major questions. Uh, we also, you know, are firm believers in that it is one of the most effective ways to hold bad actors accountable. And so, but it is not the cheapest way no, <laughs> to hold bad actors not. accountable. So any, any support that your listeners can provide is always, is always incredibly helpful to our student members. Well, I thank you so much for coming. Uh, I, I can foresee <laughs> another discussion in, in, in the future. Thank oh, you. Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Mm-hmm.